Welcome to Credit Versus Q&A Wednesday Live. That took a second to uh, activate. Uh, May 10th, 2023. I'm your host, David Mahalik. With me again is John Olsheimer. Welcome, John. Hey, Good David. Thank you very much for having me. All right. So we have been absent for a while now. Um, I wasn't on last week. I actually was battling uh, some kind of a cold or something that went all through the office, <clears throat> all through... Uh, David's family and his kids and then uh, everybody at my place. So uh, we have been gone for a couple of weeks. So the email went out late. Maybe we'll have a couple of guests. Maybe we won't. We'll see what happens. But, um, you know, scrapping the subject matter that I was going to talk about, th thinking through it a little bit better, it's probably, you know, time to switch up to something else. Um, but one of the things I, I find fascinating, John, with everything that's going on right now, it seems like the whole industry of credit is is changing it's, it's changed drastically in the last especially the last couple of years and one of the things that i'm i think i'm most excited about is the the implementation of um fico 10t uh, and also vantage score 4 4.0 so it, it it seems like it's gonna it's it's just taking a long long time for for uh fhfa to implement like a real practical scoring model and now, of course, I don't know that the timing's great because we're watching the housing market kind of slip down a little bit. And we're probably, what, maybe another year, 18 months away from that implementation, do you think? Yeah, I think the speculation is, um, and we're also going from three credit bureaus to two credit bureaus. So instead of the tri-merge, we're going to use a bi-merge report. So it, it looks like that it's going to happen largely during 2024 for, I guess, commercial implementation sometime in 2025. So um, that's a little bit further out than was initially discussed. It, it, initially, it was, you know, 18 to 24 months, but now it looks like it's actually going to be over two years. So uh, whatever, it, it, you know, this FHFA moves very slowly and mm -hmm. they're very deliberate with their actions as you I mean, it took them, it took them over 20 years to get to where we are today. Yeah. So right. it, um, it shouldn't surprise anybody that the, the last little bit is also going to take kind of a, an unreasonable amount of time to, to, to tie a bow on it. So I, I think we're going to end up being in the 2024 into 2025 and it's going to go in, in steps. So there may be a tri merge to buy merge. There may be, um, the the receipt of those new scores, but uh, also maintain the use of the older scores. So the new scores will just be received for collection and analysis purposes, and then eventually the the switch will be flipped, and then there'll be a conversion off of the older scores onto those newer scores, the 10T and Vantage Score Four. What do you think is going to be the thing that people notice most? That's going to be most impactful. Let's put aside the fact that we're going from a tri merge to a, a buy merge. As far as the scoring models themselves, what do you think are all the things that uh, people are going to notice? Now, taking consideration that for especially the past ten or fifteen years, people have gotten accustomed. By people, I mean not only the public in general, but also mortgage brokers and underwriters are kind of all of the same mind. Like you, you've got to prep your clients in a certain way to get ready for for a, a mortgage approval, because it's a little bit different. You know, things like paid collections don't really matter on on, on the old scoring model. So what do you think people are gonna notice the most? Uh, yeah. Switching over to these new models. Yeah, I think it um, I think it depends on who the people are. Um, I, I don't think from a practical perspective, the consumer's gonna notice anything. But w what's going to happen, even if they don't notice it, is that Whenever you keep them, I keep, I keep having to go backwards in time to answer this question because we're talking about the difference between, we're not talking about the difference between FICO 8 and FICO 9 or FICO 9 and FICO 10. We're really talking about the difference between four, four generations of scoring yeah. systems have passed since the, uh, the models that are currently being used in mortgage lending to FICO 10T and Vantage Score 4. Remember, when, when FHFA 
mandated the use of credit scoring, Vantage score didn't even exist. So we went, we're, we're going to go from, on the Vantage score side, we're going to go from nothing to Vantage score 4.0. On yeah. the FICO side, we're going from FICO 2, FICO 4, and FICO 5 to FICO 10. So it's, it, that's an important thing to keep in mind because normally when a lender transitions from an older credit scoring system to a newer credit scoring system, we're not talking about them jumping ahead four generations. We're talking yeah. about them moving ahead to the next most current version, which is what most lenders do. Most lenders will convert to the newer version. They won't just anchor themselves to the older version and then never convert, you know, for two decades and then all of a sudden convert. So the Number one is Fannie and Freddie are going to see a huge difference in the distribution of the scores that are generated from mortgage applications. That's a fact. That is absolutely going to happen. What that means for the consumer, the consumer is not going to notice any different. They're going to go out and they're going to apply for a mortgage. The mortgage reporting company is going to provide a buy merge report with two FICO scores and two Vantage scores per applicant. So I guess that could be eight scores total. And then is, uh, kind of the answer to Cynthia, Cynthia's question right here. What, what's the purpose of going from a tri merge to a buy merge? That, that's what we're talking about right now. Yeah, that, well, that's that's per FHFA mandate. So the answer to why is because FHFA says so, which is a stupid answer. But that's that's le the legitimate answer to the question. The industry didn't say, hey, let's go down to two. It's FHFA that said we're going to go to two instead yeah. of three. And Cynthia, the, we're, we're talking about mortgage, we're talking specifically about mortgage. Right. Yeah, we're not talking about auto, credit card, or any other industry where the, you know, where there is no Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac influence over the decision making process. What 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 the consumer will experience, although they're not going to notice this, is if they are a good credit risk, their FICO 10T score is going to be higher than their Vantage score, or I'm sorry, then their FICO 2, FICO score 4, or FICO 5 score. And because we are so many generations apart, the, the, the improvement could be considerable. The consumer who is a higher risk consumer, so in other words, someone who has poor credit, their FICO 10 scores are going to be lower than their FICO 2, FICO 4, FICO 5 scores. And again, the difference could be considerable. Now, when I, can, when I say considerable, I'm not saying 100 points, I'm, I, but I am saying it's considerable enough to where it could be the difference between an approve and deny, and certainly could be the difference between the terms that you're going to pay for a mortgage loan. So um, that's something to keep in mind. What Fannie and Freddie are going to see is they're going to see a drastic difference in score distributions because they're skipping all of these middle generations and going directly to the front of the line, if you will. And it's it's kind of like I, I've used this analogy several times discussing this, David. It is, you know, I sold a 2001 Ford Explorer and bought a 2019 Ford F-150 and it basically caught up on 18 years of technology in one day. And yeah. the, the, two, the two cars, which were both built by Ford, mind you, they had no similarities at all except for four tires and an engine and a steering wheel. But the tech was completely different. Um, the safety features, completely different. The feel of the ride, complete. It, that's what we're gonna see here. We're, we're going from my 2001 Ford Explorer to, you know, a brand new, really high end uh, truck. So the difference is going to be considerable, even though they're both the same brand of, yeah. of credit scoring system. What, what are the, some of the things that, that uh, like, if you can be specific, what are the, the, some of the things that um, 10T is going to emphasize and de-emphasize versus the, the, the classic FICO models right now? Before we answer that, I see that we've got a good group that's joined, uh, has joined us. So uh, John and I are talking about uh, uh, FHFA mandating now. Uh, this, is, this is a little ways out, maybe a couple years still uh, implementing the new FICO 10T and also new Vantascore 4.0 for decision-making on mortgage loans.
But this is just where we're starting uh, from today. You are more than welcome to um, to add, uh, you know, add any questions you want, any comments you want. If you have questions, that's what we're here to do. We'll answer them for you. So um, feel free to uh, make the best use of this time. That's what we're here for. Okay, so John, if you if you would. Yeah, so the, the primary difference is, um, well, the credit report has changed considerably. That's not really a credit scoring thing, but the credit report has changed considerably since the implementation of these old FICO scores versus the FICO scores that are going to be used in the next couple of years. Number one, there are no more judgments and no more tax liens on credit reports. So the newer models had to be built yeah. un, had to be built with that in mind, where these older models are still out there looking for tax liens and judgments. And so th those older models are actually built and tuned with the expectation of seeing tax liens and judgments. That's obviously no longer a thing. These newer models are tuned to consider information uh, and the presence of derogatory information, but never tax liens or judgments. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, number two is these newer models also are uh, considering the NCAP modifications to credit reports. So the National Consumer mm -hmm. Assistance Program, and if you there's there are like three years worth of changes to credit reports. So uh, if you if if anyone watching wants to Google National Consumer Assistance Program or NCAP, you can read through all of the changes that were made. There was a change to there was a a sunsetting of the prior credit reporting language. Um, that, that's that's really a big deal, um, even though it's not a very sexy thing. Um, right. And then that tax lien and judgment is part of that as well. The the real the real big deal is the consideration of the 24 month trended data in these newer scoring models, where the older models didn't see it. Number one, it didn't exist back then, and number two, because it didn't exist, the models weren't built to see it because they didn't know what to look for because it didn't exist on a credit report. So really, it's a combination of um, a difference in the credit scoring systems, but but really because of the difference in the credit reports. Yeah. So that, I think it's like you said, it's going to be great news for people who have done some good work on their credit. They pay their bills on time. Um, mostly, I think where we're going to see it, like one of the one of the cheat codes, not for lack of a better expression, one of, one of the, the first things that mortgage brokers tell their clients to do is like, listen, your score is going to be really, really sensitive to credit card balances that especially when you start getting over 10, 20 percent or so, uh, you know, you can see a, a pretty big drop in in your credit score uh, when you're when you're overutilized. Well, even though that might be the case with the new scoring models, it's really not looking at what are your what's on your credit report at this very moment. It's going to go. It's going to look at how you pay credit card debt over the last twenty four months. So, that, so would you you think that that's not really going to be quite the the gimmick in the future when prepping somebody up to buy a home? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the advice that you give a consumer has to change a little bit, right? Um, understanding that FICO 10T is only important right now for mortgage lending. You, maybe someday it's going to have critical mass of users in credit card and auto loans, but it doesn't have an auto. It, you know, all these other FICO scores um, have the auto adjusted and the bank card version of these scores. Though That doesn't exist in FICO 10T. So, um, and I'm going to double check that while we're on our hour here, just to make sure I didn't just say something that's wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's correct. I, I actually interviewed FICO about 10 t and took some notes, and so I'm going to look that up while we're, while we're chatting. Um, but certainly the advice that we have to give people now is different because we used to tell people, hey, you know, check your credit reports a couple of months before you apply for a mortgage, and if you see anything incorrect, then you know, dispute it and make sure that it's corrected, and so your scores will be as good as possible. And if you can, you know, pay down your credit card debt to as, um, as as low as you possibly can, and so therefore your utilization will be really low, and and your FICO score will be as high as possible when you make your application. So that's obviously still 
um, that's still a relevant and valuable advice to give someone when they apply for a mortgage. The, the, the problem is, is that because these scoring models look at your balances on your credit cards for the past two years, just paying off your balance two months before you apply for a mortgage doesn't erase the fact that you had high balances and high utilization for the past, you know, 22 of the past 24 months. So, so yeah. really to, to the extent, um, to, to the extent you're giving advice to someone who's applying for a mortgage, really your advice is, well, this is really good advice. If you're applying for a mortgage in two years, if you're applying for a mortgage in two months, then obviously the advice is, well, pay your credit cards down as much as you can. Yeah. And, you know, if you've got good credit, otherwise you'll probably be in good shape. But if you have a two year horizon for applying for a mortgage loan, which who the hell does? No one, no one's like, hey, in, in, you know, in, in, um, in May of 2025, I'm going to apply for a mortgage loan. What should I do to prepare my credit? No one does that. But yeah. The advice would be pay your cards down as much as you can and then maintain low balances because then you've established that 24 month history of having low balances. So I, I asked FICO in an interview with them, um, will there be the adjusted versions, the industry adjusted versions for FICO 10 and FICO 10T? Um, they said that they will offer the industry specific versions in the 10T suite but did not confirm which ones yet. So I, th I think we're still, we still don't know if it's gonna be FICO Auto, T FICO 10T Auto, FICO 10T Bank Card, or just FICO 10 Auto and FICO 10 Bank Card. And for those of you who just noticed that I took out the letter T, there's actually two versions of FICO 10. There's FICO 10 that does not consider the 24 month trended data, and then FICO 10T, and T stands for trended, and so that does consider the trended data. So there, there are actually, um, there are actually two separate types of the FICO 10 model, the FICO 10 and FICO 10 T. What what's the scenario do you think where I, I can see the value in, in trended data? I think it's a more holistic picture as to what is somebody's spending habits because you might have caught them at a time with, with with the scoring how the scoring models work. You just might have caught them at a time where, I don't know, maybe they bought some, or they're funding a business or putting the kid through college or they moved and are you know buying a bunch of furniture or something like that. Maybe they're floating that on cards, uh, which would be kind of an exception. It would be outside of what their normal buying behavior uh, would be. It's just a blip in time. So I can see the value in trended data. Um, what, why would you think that somebody would, a, a lender would, would omit uh, or would, would bypass the 10 T option and want to go just for FICO 10. Yeah. Well, the answer to the question is really, I mean, I'm going to answer your question with a question, which is why do you use credit scores in the first place? And the reason you use credit scores in the first place is, pred is to predict the risk of something, right? Do I want to lend this person money to buy a house? Do I want to lend this person money to buy a car? Do I want to let this person have a credit card? So, so the, the entire purpose of a credit score is to help answer that question. And to the extent that you have a choice between 10 and 10 T, um, the, the trend of data is very valuable. It is, and, and it's, and th this isn't a secret. Fannie knows it. Fannie implemented trend of data a long time ago, just not in credit scores in their, in DU, Fannie Mae considers trend of data and has for many years. TransUnion has a product called Credit Vision that has considered trended data for many years. So it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a relationship between how you manage accounts over time and risk. And so mm -hmm. to the extent that you really want to use the best tool and you're comfortable as a lender telling your customers, hey, I'm considering your trended data, uh, then that's why you'd want to use 10T versus just using 10. In regarding uh, FICO 10, 10T, when I know I know that model is out now, we're we're, we're talking about for, for everybody watching, we're talking about when is that going to be implemented in, in mortgage decision making. But if I wanted to see that score, um, the only place I can think of is FICO is myfico.com. Is that That's right. is that up right now where you could if you want to go create an account with them? It's a little it's a little pricey, but it is. 
It, it is. So yeah, you can actually um, you can actually look at your 10T scores on the MyFICO website. And you're right, it, there's a cost involved with it, but it is something that is available on um, on their website. Yeah, that might be something to do a little bit later on. I'm excited about that. Okay. Um, oh, El Diablo's back. Uh, greatly appreciate the information that's provided on this group. I'm finally getting back on track of credit uh, because of Crediversio. Love hearing that. Very good. And we got a pretty good sized group. I'm putting the offer out there again. John and I are here to answer your questions. Just because we're talking about mortgage and ten and FICO ten and ten T doesn't mean we need to stay on that topic. If you've got something else you want to ask, it's uh, the only thing that I ask of you is we just keep it related to credit education, credit scores, uh, any questions about the bureaus, how FICO works, how Vantage Score works. Happy to answer those questions for you. Anything uh, credit repair related, you can post the question. I'll probably just have to swing back and answer that a little bit later. Um, all right. Well, I mean, that's I, that's exciting stuff for me. And, you know, we, we, we're, we're already seeing some some pretty big changes like NCAP was a big one from, I, I know it started, uh, was it 2017 or 2018 when, when it was the this, this second phase of NCAP when they eliminated, and NCAP was the National Consumer Assistance Program, I believe is what that stood for. And I believe that was uh, in the second phase of it, three phases, I believe. One of the phases was the move to Metro 2. Was that the second phase or was that the first phase? I mean, I don't know how much it really matters. I'm just being technical right now. But um, but I, I, I think that second phase is, is uh, of implementation was probably in 17. And that's yeah, when I, I don't I don't remember the exact. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that was happening over a variety of years. So I, and yeah. I don't have them. They're all they've been done for several years now. And I don't have them all committed to memory. But this the heavy the stuff that was really easy to do, like, you know, put some education and edu put educa educational text on your website, that was mm -hmm. in the first of the, of the several milestones. So it's doing something like putting text on a website, which is very easy to do. That was something that had to be done earlier on in the process. The stuff that, that required more programming and more heavy lifting by users of credit reports, like converting off of Metro onto Metro 2, um, that's the kind of thing that they gave the industry a longer runway um, and, and to convert to, which obviously made, you know, that made a ton of sense because you can't just tell 14,000 users of credit reports, hey, you haven't, you have six months to make this change. You know, we know you're not busy with anything else, but so, so they were given, they were given several years to actually make, make that change. Yeah. And then of course, the, the, I think you mentioned it before, the removal of, um, of uh, tax liens, judgments from credit reports. That was a, um, that was that was kind of a big deal. That was a mixed bag. I don't remember exactly why they thought that was going to be a, a good thing. Um, I, tax I, lien. So, so I will tell you that it's first off. I don't like that change whatsoever. I I don't I don't like, and I know everyone watching is probably like this guy's crazy, but. Um, I'm only crazy if you're trying to get tax liens off your credit reports, right? If you don't have a tax lien, then why do you care? But the, I think the credit report, I think the value of a credit report is being diluted because of the removal of information, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's amazing how all the stuff that's being removed is negative, right? You know, no one's asking that your positive information is removed, but things that indicate that you're high risk um, and therefore may not be a good borrower, that's the kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff that's being removed, and I don't think that's good for the industry. Um, and for those of you who don't agree with me, you know, think about what you would ask to see if someone you knew wanted to borrow a boatload of money from you. You probably would want to see if they have pending judgments and tax liens and medical collections that are unpaid. That's a fair and reasonable thing to want to see as someone who's lending hundreds of millions or billions of dollars out every single year. But no, you can't see those things because they're not on credit reports any longer. There's other ways to find it. But yeah. if you're relying on garden variety credit reports, that stuff is, yeah. is gone. It de you know, it depends on who you believe, David. So I went to one of Matt's events, credit con events, and a plaintiff's attorney, I'm not gonna out him because I like him and I don't think that's fair. 
but a very, very well-known and very reputable plaintiff's attorney basically took credit for, for that because of repeatedly suing the credit bureaus with respect to incorrect tax lien and judgment information appearing on yeah. the wrong consumer's credit reports. I've been in this industry for 31 years. I have never seen a tax lien go on the wrong person's credit report. I've never seen a judgment show up on the wrong person's credit report. The, I've seen a bankruptcy show up on the wrong person's credit report once because it was filed with a transposed social security number. That doesn't mm. have anything to do with the credit bureaus getting it wrong. The filing of it was wrong. But but to suggest that there was this some sort of widespread systemic problem with tax liens and judgments showing up on the wrong consumer's credit reports is just patently wrong. That is factually inaccurate. But if you, you can say it if you want to say it, but there's no evidence to support it. So that's what's called a theory, which means it's not been proven. Nonetheless, yeah. t tax liens and judgments are off of consumer credit reports, but that, 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 does, that doesn't mean that they don't exist. It just means that they're not on credit reports any longer. You still have judgments. You still have tax liens. They still cause problems, even though you can't look at them on a credit report any longer. Obviously, if, if they're not on a credit report, you can't. Uh, they can't influence a credit score. So that may have helped some people to have higher credit scores artificially. So they, they now have artificially higher credit scores because their liens and judgments are gone. Yeah. So, well, um, you know, that, you know, that, that, that's, that's kind of the backstory to that whole <clears throat> deletion of tax liens and, and judgments. Yeah. It, it all, really what it did, and I think we talked about this uh, probably a year or two ago, is that, you know, the the... Sure, it's it's created um, an environment where where people aren't going to be penalized for for that information anymore. However, that's that's on a score level, on a credit report and a score level. But when we're talk about when we talk about like higher level lending, uh, mortgage, business loan, things where the, uh, where more due diligence is going to be done, we're not talking about just straight up like a like a, a desktop desktop underwriting where it, the decisions are made just instantaneous. Uh, based on what's on a credit report and the score and you know whatever you know DTI data that they can uh, that they can come up with. But if you're going to do a get a mortgage, if you're going to do uh, even like debt consolidation, or you're going to get a business loan, they're going to see that stuff because now they're going to rely on those secondary reports where all that data is. You know, if you want to, if if you go to a LexisNexis or SageStream, I, I think they merged. But you know your tax liens. Your judgments are they're right there. Uh, so even though they're not gonna they're not gonna factor into a score, they're certainly gonna factor into um, the the lender's uh, qualification as far as what they look at to uh, to make a, a lending decision. Yeah, and, and look, you, I mean, for those of you who have ever bought a house and taken out a mortgage loan. You had to provide copies of your tax returns. You also had to sign documents that gave your mortgage lender permission to go and get your tax documents directly yeah. from the IRS themselves. They know if you're filing your returns or not. And so it's it's not hard for them to find out if you've got tax liens. There, you know, and you're right, LexisNexis also it's a public records vendor, and that's why they're called public records, because anybody can go look for that stuff. They're, that's mm -hmm. what public record means. So so there's other ways to, to skin that cat. And the Fannie 1003, which is the Uniform Residential Mortgage Loan application that we've all filled out if we've ever bought a house using a mortgage lender's money. Um, they ask you, do you have any pending, are there any pending lawsuits? So or, uh, do you have any outstanding lawsuits or something, something about outstanding lawsuits or judgments against you? Yeah. It is judgments. And so you have to, you have to answer yes. If, the answer is yes. If you answer no, then you've just lied on a credit application. That's a federal offense. So, um, you obviously, yeah, not, not again, there's, there's other ways to find out that information. Yeah. Yeah, there aren't any real secrets anymore. I mean, everything is pretty much laid bare for mm -hmm. for, for everybody. All right. So, we're, we're a little over a half hour in. Um, we've got well over a dozen people on the uh, live. Maybe, yeah, actually quite a bit more than that. Um, any questions that John and I can answer for you? Otherwise, we're probably just going to drone on about FICO 10 and 10T and 
and then uh, end cap and, uh, you know, stuff that, that uh, you may or not be. I mean, I think it's interesting stuff. And uh, we always have a handful of people who just sit on a watch like, wow, I never, never knew that, never knew that. May, might not affect your life, might not improve your life, but uh, it's certainly fascinating. And sometimes trivia is just interesting because it's good trivia. Um, all right. So we'll give everybody a minute or two. If you, if you haven't even said hello, say hello. We've got a couple of people that uh, uh, posted up here. Um, so, you know, one of the other things, do, do we go into, uh, oh, here we go. Alfreda, what do we got here from YouTube? Uh, when they do the title report for the house, if you have a judgment, it will show up. Is that a question, Alfredo? It sounds like he's just making a statement, which okay. you know indicates that there's yet another way for for that stuff to to end up being considered by a lender. Yeah, and it's one of the things that you know if you want to buy a home, if you've got an outstanding judgment, they don't like underwriters don't like seeing things like that because if you um, now, John, maybe you might have a little bit more expertise in this than I do, because this, this is going to test my days of, of uh, you know, buying and selling property. Uh, yes, yeah, she says making a statement, uh, you know, years and years ago. But, you know, one of the things that mortgage brokers don't like to see is a judgment because uh, that, that mortgage broker wants to be first position as far as the, the lien holder. And let's say you've got a judgment out there ten thousand twenty thirty thousand dollars let's say you got equity in that house now you have an asset for that for that um uh that plaintiff to go after um yeah no the 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 look the the challenge that they're all facing right now is is kind of the balance between um you know, apply, you know, interest rates are higher, housing prices are higher, inventory is lower, but but improving. Um, Fannie Mae's requirements are about to change if they haven't already changed, if you haven't followed those. It's very political, so I don't know if we want to get into that, about the whole subsi subsidizing of lower scoring consumers from higher consumer, higher scoring consumers paying higher fees. Yeah. Um, so it's, look, it's, you know, ultimately, the the best thing for the consumer to do is to put yourself in the best position possible, and that means having as high a score as you can, as having the best income relative to your debt that you can, and having the best value of the home relative to the loan amount that you can. Obviously, there are certain things that are in your control. There are certain things that are out of your control. Everyone wants to make more money, but you can't just, you know, snap your fingers and be making more money. Um, but to the extent that you can control your debt, then that's, that's important and that's what you should do. And one of the things that I think flies under the radar a lot, David, is when you, when you apply for, not, this doesn't have anything to do with auto loans or credit cards, but for some reason, mortgages always tend to take priority uh, because I, they're they're usually the largest amount of money that someone ever borrows mm -hmm. over the history of their life, yeah. and therefore, um, th therefore, every basis point of your interest rate is meaningful. Which means that if you can improve your score even twenty points or forty points and get that interest rate lower by an eighth of a point over time, that starts to pile, it really starts to make a difference. It's thousands and thousands of dollars over mm -hmm. time that you're not having to pay in interest because your score was just even maybe a little bit better than, than, it, uh, than it otherwise would have been had you have done nothing. And so still the, the best thing for you to do is to try to improve the score as much as possible because the value of a lower priced or a cheaper mortgage is so much better than, you know, a car loan uh, that's cheaper or credit card interest rates that are cheaper. Uh, you know, the, the interest you pay on a credit card is optional, right? You, you know, no yeah. one forced you to get into so much credit card debt that you couldn't pay it off every month. So really you, you know, it's optional. You've chosen to get yourself into credit card debt. That you can't pay off every month. And therefore now 
you're paying on average 17% APR for a general use credit card, which is crazy. No one would pay that for a mortgage and no one would pay that for a car loan, but we'd gladly pay it for a credit card. And if you have a retail store card, then your APRs are into the 20s. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't really matter what your credit is like. Um, everyone pays those types of APRs for retail store cards. So it's, it's crazy how, um, how bad they are. But in the mortgage world, it, it's, you really have two points in time where your credit matters. You have the initial application, and that kind of helps to cross the bridge of, well, I mean, can I even get pre-approved? Am I even bankable? And if yeah. I am bankable, what's my APR likely going to be? And how much is this going to cost? And can I even afford it? So you, you have that initial hurdle to get over. But then if you, for those of you who've ever applied for a mortgage loan, you have probably been told repeatedly by your mortgage broker, don't go out and apply for credit during underwriting. Because if you do, then we may have to reconsider doing a loan for you because your debt to incomes are going to be different than what we understand them to be. Your credit scores could be different than what they were X number of weeks ago when we pulled your credit reports. And you may have just gone from being qualified to being unqualified during the underwriting period. So, you know, when you're going through the process of applying for, and that's a construction loan or a mortgage, you know, you you really want to put your credit on hiatus first to some extent and just wait until you close. And then, of course, once the loan's in place and it's been onboarded, then then you can kind of resume with your normal credit acquisition practices. So where where for auto an auto loan, you know, it's one and done. For a credit card, one and done. For mortgage yeah. lending, it's really two and mm-hmm. done. So that's something that people have to keep in mind if they're yeah. out there looking for a mortgage. Dell's got a question for us. If I do not own a home, what is a good credit mix? Auto loan, personal loan, uh, and credit cards? Yeah, so it, the scoring systems do like to see that you have installment related experience. And so that's going to be things like auto loans, personal loans, student loans, uh, because those are installment, those are installment accounts. Um, having said that, I, I want to be very clear. I want to give you a kind of a sense of relativity is where does that fall on the meter of importance? And it's right down there at the bottom with inquiries as far as how important your credit mix is. So yeah. Uh, is it is it nice to have a, a variety of different accounts on your credit report? Of course it is. Um, do you do better if you have a variety of different accounts? Yes, uh, because you've checked those boxes of, the, of being able to manage different type. Because obviously, for those of you who have ever had a mortgage, it's not the same as managing a credit card, and it's not the same as managing an auto loan, right? They're even though they all fall under the umbrella of credit, they're not. They're definitely not the same animal. So. Um, you know, having revolving and installment, you're, you're generally going to do better than just having revolving types of accounts. Um, but, you know, if, if you don't have a good payment history and if your credit card utilization isn't low, then, you know, having a good credit mix is almost like um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's underwhelming because you're not doing well in the really important categories, but you're doing really well in, in one almost meaningless category. So it's really what I would call um, a secondary characteristic or secondary set of metrics. It's, it's, it's fantastic as icing on top of the cake, but it's certainly not the cake. Yeah, and also too, uh, John, uh, another thing is like with uh, an installment loan, it doesn't necessarily have to be an open installment loan, um, like, you know, so don't go out and get a personal loan or go get a car. It's just, you, you check the box if you at some point had uh, an installment loan on the, on the credit report. That's right, yeah, and, and yeah. but keep in mind that if you, uh, um, if you had an installment loan and it's on your credit report and now all of a sudden it's gone, then the credit score yeah. doesn't know that it used to be there. Right. And that was actually one of the, I know you weren't in the room, but that was actually one of the discussions that was going on at, at CreditCon was, and I think the crowd may have gotten some incorrect information from the speaker. It was, does your, do credit scores still consider the payment history of closed accounts? And obviously that's 
I mean, the answer is clearly yes, right? I mean, you can have a you can have a credit card that has a, a you know years of late payments, and you and if you close the credit card, the credit score doesn't magically um, right. gloss over all of those late payments. Right. It right, doesn't right. work like that. So, um, so, so, so certainly the, even though credit scoring systems don't have a memory, they don't know what used to be on your credit report. If it's no longer on your credit report, they certainly can see and consider the history of your accounts just as long as they're still on the credit report. Yeah, exactly. All right. Okay, everybody. So we're John. We're you know well over forty minutes. Um, yeah, it goes you know, quick. We're, we're we're coming down to the end of this. Anybody have any last minute questions before John and I call it a night? I think that's probably the most in depth we've gone over ten T. In fact, I think I would argue that we probably went into just about as much detail as um, oh, what was her name at Credit Con? Gigi. Gigi, right. I was about to say Edie, but like, no, that's not right, Gigi. Mm -hmm. But I'm not exactly sure how much time she spent on uh Yeah, I think the, the the big takeaway about 10T is don't don't get anchored to this trended data thing. All right. So I what what you shouldn't do is you shouldn't you shouldn't sit there and think, oh my gosh, I, I pay my credit cards in full every month, but man, I always have high balances. That's me. That's me. I use my credit cards for everything, everything. And I, but I pay them off in full every month. I'm a, what's called a transactor. Mm -hmm. And I do that because A, you have fantastic fraud protections when you use credit cards. You have basically no liability unless you just don't ever notify the bank that you're the victim of fraud. So you have no liability for fraud. And number two, you know, I like piling up rewards points. I just took a trip. I just actually got back from a trip earlier today. The entire trip cost me $9. That included hotel, rent a car. Actually, that's not true. I had dinner last night and I had to pay for my dinner. But the travel related aspects of it, like the planes, yeah. trains, and automobiles, yeah. $9. And that's because yeah. I used points to pay for everything. And so therefore, in that's why I use my cards for everything. I'm, buy, I'm not buying more stuff. Just be, I'm just buying the stuff that I normally would buy. I'm paying for them with credit cards. But because of that, I have, you know, a, a relatively impressive, <laughs> impressive balance every single month, um, even though I, I pay it in full. So FICO 10T is not going to like me. It's not going to like me because I have not high utilization, but I have large balances month over month. And I have very, actually have very low utilization because I have a boatload of credit limits. So, and I've done that over time. I've accumulated a lot of high limit credit cards on purpose, kind of to act as utilization insurance uh, as yeah. a safety net. So if I do have to go out and spend a, a ton of money on credit cards, it's not going to spike my utilization so much that it's going to kill my scores. But I do have, I, I do have a large monthly average credit card balance, even though I pay it in full to zero, but you know, your credit report never shows that at all. It just, it just shows what your balance was month over month. So, but don't, don't get so wrapped up that you, you know, that you make yourself sick when we're talking about trended data and FICO 10 T what's still the most important thing is still the most important thing, which is, do you have derogatory information on your credit reports? That has nothing to do with FICO 10T and trended data. It has everything to do with whether or not there's a history of um, late payments, account statuses that indicate delinquency or some form of default, collections, and bankruptcies. So if you don't have any of that stuff, then you've just banked essentially a third of the points because that's it's still the 35, 30, 15, 10, 10 pie chart in 10T. Number two, do you have low utilization or relatively low utilization? And do you have a limited number of cards with balances? If the answer is yes, you're still going to do well. And then obviously the other metrics that have nothing to do with trended data, how is your credit report old? Do you have a nice uh, diverse set of accounts and have you limited your inquiries? And if the answer is yes, 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 then you're going to do well. It doesn't matter if it's FICO 10, FICO 10T, 
FICO 8, FICO 9, FICO 2, 4, 5, Vantage score 1, 2, 3, 4. Doesn't matter. They all look for those things. They all look for like the, the, the seven deadly sins, which is defaults, derogatory collections, high utilization. Um, it, 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 they're all looking for that kind of stuff. And to the extent that you don't have that, then you're going to do well across every pl credit scoring platform, regardless of the name, the generation, or from what credit bureau it came from. Let's finish up with uh, Dell's question here. I pay off credit cards every month to zero, but but is carrying a 1% utilization better than zero uh, and my balance is always reported as zero? Yeah, and that's a that's one of those weird, It you know, it kind of seems like a myth. That's kind of so silly that it's it kind of seems like a myth, but it's actually not a myth. Um, in, in FICO's utilization metrics, Low is good, but some is better than none. And so it's true that 1%, and good luck getting to 1%, because that means you have to know what your aggregate credit limits are, which means you have to know what 1% of your aggregate credit limits are, which means that you're the, you have to pay down your credit cards prior to your statement closing date, not by your due date, prior to your statement closing date to the point where it's 1% of whatever your aggregate credit limit is. That's, that's impressive if you're able to do that. And I would argue unnecessary unless you're just about to apply, to apply for something and then you know that some lender is going to pull your credit reports right after your credit reports have been updated to reflect your 1% utilization. So, so yes, that's, it is absolutely true, Dell. 1% is better than 0%. Um, but it's, that's kind of a hard thing to hit because it's, it's just such a move. You can control so many things, and there are certain things that are out of your control. Um, but but yes, one percent is in fact better than zero percent. Yeah, the, I'll, I'll we'll wrap up with this last story. So John, I remember it was one of the credit cohorts, maybe two thousand seventeen, eighteen. I don't remember where you you hit where your one percent. I remember you showed us uh, you had a um, a slide up on the screen showing us. Uh, one of your credit scores that had that was 850 you had a perfect 850 credit score and you said and you admitted to the audience like listen this was not intentional i i don't i'm a transactor i don't carry balances but my wife charged something and i i didn't see it or i didn't pay it or i can't remember exactly what the what the reason was but it was purely accidental it's probably and on, it's probably on a that. retail store card probably on a yeah, retail yes. store card yeah I, I think that's what it was i think that's what it was but because of that, it just happened to strike that 1%. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it was sort of a comical thing you put up on the screen that you hit an, eight, an 850 very much by accident, not by knowing what, that your wife had, uh, had charged something. And guess <laughs> what? I didn't get any better interest rate or no one called me and gave me a, an award. No one sent me a cake. Nothing, nothing great happened because <laughs> I took a screen capture. But other than that, um, it, right. you know, nothing, nothing great happened in my life when that, when that happened. Yeah. And Dell, uh, let me just bring that up. Um, your score is not moving. Listen, there could be a handful of things that are the cause of that chasing that 1% is not going to be the thing that like, if you're floating around 650 or 750 or whatever, that 1% is not going to be the difference. Yeah, you got bigger fish to fry. Yeah, I mean, it, it especially could if be you're floating around me. 650. If you're floating around 750, then you're floating in a good part of the pool. If you're floating yeah. in the 650, in the in the a 650 part of the pool, it's not the best part of the pool. Yeah, yeah, that's a little bit more work to do there. All right, thank you so much, everybody, for joining me and John today. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll look forward to. Um, I thought maybe another question, but Sean was just uh, just making a comment. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. And if, uh, if anybody's watching this in the replay and you post, I'll be, uh, be sure to circle back around and answer the questions. John, thanks again for a great time and great content. And uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks or so. Yes, sir. Thank you for having All me. Right. Take care.